Hello, my name is Julian Edgar and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension, Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. And in this video, I want to introduce you to that book. What's in it? Why should you buy it? What, what, what are you going to get out of it? Let's take a look. So the first thing to take on board is it's quite a detailed book. It's uh, around 245 pages, 100,000 words, 500 images. It's not a superficial look. As far as I know, it's the first book on the history of car suspension, and I wanted to make it sufficiently detailed that the reader could really understand the changes that occurred over that period. So I look at things like the technical aspects of suspension, roll centers, things of that sort. I cover significant cars. I look at uh, some really rare resources, such as this uh, front wheel drive suspension on the cord. I look at cars that were contentious, such as the Corvair. It covers a really wide range. So it's not just about sporting cars, and it's not just about luxury cars, and it's not just about the technology. It's about all of those things. So, chapter one. Chapter one, I cover the technical aspects of suspension, and there are three major areas that I look at. The first is roll centers. The second is virtual swing arm lengths, and the final one is natural frequencies. And if you're going, oh my gosh, this sounds like it's gonna be a really complex book, it is only in chapter one that I cover that degree of technical uh, detail. Uh, it's a chapter you can read if you want, if you wanna further understand the suspension systems that are discussed later in the book, or you might wanna skip that or maybe come back to it later when maybe I talk about a roll center height of a particular suspension. But it's certainly a sufficiently detailed look in chapter one to get your head right round the fundamental concepts of suspension. Chapters two right through to chapter 13, I take you on a journey. Uh, it's typically one decade per chapter. And so over those uh, chapters, I cover the significant cars. Which are the cars that came out that really revolutionized suspension design? I cover the, the uh, significant people and there are some wonderful personalities that I discovered and, and cover in this book. And I cover the significant suspension systems. You now things like torsion beam rear axles in front wheel drive, things like my first and struts at the front of so many cars, semi-trailing arms at the back of cars. I cover these in, in enough detail, again, that you can really get your head around and understand what their advantages were and what their disadvantages were. So as an example, in one of the early chapters, I cover Lanchester, Frederick Lanchester and his car. And Lanchester has become one of my heroes. He was really the first vehicle dynamicist. He understood the mathematics of suspension in terms of things like spring rates, natural frequencies. He, he was also an incredibly funny man to read his comments and his writings, especially when he was responding to critics. I was able to find some of that discussion in those very old technical papers and he is biting in his witty replies. It's just amazing to read it, you know, 120 years after he actually wrote it. Here's one of his cars, the most significant car, I think. You can see, firstly, the massive amount of suspension travel it's got, and you can see also the stiffness of the body. And in those days, those two things were not at all common. Lanchester, just an amazing guy. That's a mid-mount engine in that car. Going on to the 1930s, and of course I'm just doing a snapshot here, there's lots in between 1901 and 1930. Morris Olley, uh, ex-Rolls-Royce engineer, went to the United States. Rolls-Royce had a uh, department there, if you like, an extension of the company, and then when that finished, he went to General Motors. And General Motors had a huge regard for Olley and gave him a massive budget. Make our cars ride better without detracting from handling. And Ollie came up with the concept still known as flat ride, less pitch, less up and down of the front and back of the car. And to be able to introduce effective flat ride, low pitch ride, he had to go to independent front suspension. And here's an Oldsmobile from the uh, mid, mid late 30s showing double wishbone front suspension. He was so persuasive in his demonstration cars that the GM, even in the middle of the Great Depression, the GM management said, yep, let's equip all our cars with independent front suspension. A massive change in a whole range of things. Spring rates dropped at the front, all sorts of things. Quite, quite incredible to read about it. Going post-World War II now to the 1950s, 
the, the development of air suspension in the US in the 50s was just phenomenal. The amount of technical advance that was made then uh, is still reflected in air suspension systems of today. And the ride frequencies, the softness that they achieved, especially in single wheel bumps, was just absolutely exemplary. Trouble was, the technology wasn't up to, to what they were trying to commercialize. And these cars had catastrophic failures. You had air springs exploding in holding yards. You had all sorts of problems. And so air suspension got dropped. It was only there for three or four years. And yet all the technical advances that were made in that time, as I say, are reflected in air suspension coming back into, into use now. Though these days, of course, with electronic control, which they didn't have then. I found that one of the most interesting areas to write about, the 1950s US air suspension cars. 1960s, crossing the Atlantic back to the UK, Alex Moulton, an incredibly ingenious engineer who developed what became known as hydroelastic suspension. This is the single most innovative suspension in the book. Nothing uh, in any modern cars comes close to the innovation of hydroelastic. I, I don't have time here to describe it. It's covered in detail in the book. Rubber springing, inbuilt dampers inside the springs, interconnected suspension front to rear to reduce pitch even more than could be achieved with Ollie's approach. Just an incredible design fitted to millions of cars and typically very cheap cars. And that's a very interesting idea to take on board. The most innovative suspension in the book was fitted to millions of cheap cars. It wasn't just the domain of very expensive cars. 1980s, really the invention of all wheel drive in uh, performance uh, with the Audi Quattro. Just a fascinating uh, section in the book, uh, quoting from the engineer who was behind that, quoting his ideas. Well, front wheel drive's got problems, rear wheel drive's got problems in terms of control and tire tire wear. What about all wheel drive? And then how can we make it actually work in, by incorporating a center differential? So the start of the all wheel drive revolution in performance cars. 1990s McLaren F1. I uh, managed to find a really interesting detailed technical paper on the development of the suspension and the rear suspension was particularly interesting. The way they linked its action uh, through the mechanism of the gearbox which was supporting part of that suspension. A really really interesting section I think. And up to the 2010s, Porsche with their air suspension on this car. It, it, it was really a very, very good design. Yes, it did take a lot of clues right back from the 1950s. And that's why I love writing about technical histories because you can see ideas being repeated, being reinvented, being picked up again. And the Porsche air suspension really is a class act. I think a lot of people aren't aware that Porsche do run air suspension on some of their cars for the huge handling and ride advantages that you can actually get from those systems. All right, so that was chapters up to chapter 14, uh, for up to, uh, to 13. Chapter 14, I decided to do a final chapter in the book which looked sequentially at change over time because there's some massive changes that have occurred over the period covered by the book and there's been a, a gradual change. And so one of those is body stiffness. For good handling, you need very stiff bodies and bodies of the cars in the 20s and the 30s were just so floppy, it's unbelievable. You could literally twist them just by standing on them. Uh, and we always, we go now to cars like the Audi A8 shown there in the top right and uh, so much high strength steel, so much gusseting, incredibly stiff body figures, which I actually quote in the book. And also over that time, a complete revolution in body and frame construction. And there we have a, a picture of a, a wooden frame body being lifted off the, the steel chassis. And uh, again, uh, it's so floppy, so flexible. We go right through to monocoque construction. We also look at uh, FRP, fiberglass reinforced plastic construction. Just a, an amazing change over that period. And the last section of that chapter is about static stability factor, the overturning, the ability of a car to overturn or resist overturning when it's sliding and it hits something, trips on gutters and so on. And you might say, what's that got to do with handling? Well, clearly it's got a lot to do with the stability of the car. And we look at st static stability factors of some modern cars, but we also go back to, as that diagram in the bottom left shows, the cord. 
the cord of the 1930s actually had an exemplary static stability factor. Its mass, its distributions of mass were so low, its center of gravity was so low compared with the track, the width between the wheels. It's really interesting looking at all these sequential changes. So here are some of the images from the book. As I said, over 500 images. A lot of those are very rare, unusual images. Uh, we have torsion beam suspension. We have Mercedes suspension. We have independent front suspension with swing arms. Just think about those camber changes. We have independent uh, semi-trailing arm suspension. We have cars like the 2CV Citroen interconnected suspension. I cover the invention of ABS and stability control as making such a dramatic difference to car handling. We look at cars, seminal cars like the Datsun 510, 1600 in some markets with its independent rear suspension. I actually got to uh, uh, get some direct quotes from the engineer responsible for developing those uh, Datsun suspension systems. The Porsche 928 with its rear steering suspension system, a huge range. The, the uh, uh, famous cover of Modern Motor Magazine where they were comparing a BMW against a Holden and they said the Holden was way ahead in its handling. You know, why was that the case? What went wrong and what did BMW do in their next model? A whole range of fascinating things. Uh, the Corvair, I don't think I've pictured it there, but the Corvair, why did the Corvair get such a terrible reputation? Was that reputation deserved? I go back and look at all the original road tests. I have quotes there from the engineering manager of GM defending the uh, Corvair's handling. It's just a, another fascinating story. So the book's called Car Suspension, over 120 years of ride and handling. It's out now. It's available direct from Amazon in each country. Uh, you can order it also direct from Amazon in the US, even if you're outside of the US. It's out now. As far as I'm aware, it's the only book that covers the whole history of car suspension. And boy, isn't it a fascinating story? Thank you.